uh, Pamela and Ivy for inviting me to facilitate the session. To give you a brief introduction of who I am, my name is Anita Thomas. I serve as the chair of the NGO Committee on Financing for Development and as a representative to the UN for the Women First International Fund, which provides grants, small grants to women, women for the economic empowerment of women and girls globally, which was previously known as Virginia Gildersleeve International Fund. Women First strategically supports small and emerging organizations working on gender equity issues in their own communities. The NGO Committee on Financing for Development, which was founded in 2004, is one of the 22 substantive committees of the Conference of NGOs in consultative relationship with the UN. The committee advocates on financing for development matters from the lens of leaving no one behind principle. I also serve as a convener of the NGO Coalition Against Violence and Harassment in the World of Work, ILOC 190. The coalition was founded by four substantive committees of Congo, the NGO Committee on FFD, the NGO Committee on the Status of Women, NGO Committee on Social Development, NGO Committee on Migration in partnership with the NGO Committee to Stop Trafficking in Persons. Since its creation, a bit more than a year back, the coalition has been collaborating with the ILO office in New York. We drafted a letter calling for ratification, received 1,155 endorsements from civil society organizations and submitted it to UN member states. We are currently in our out outreach efforts with member states. If you are interested in learning more about our efforts and to advance advocacy on the ground, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Post my email in the chat now. I will hand over to my co-facilitator and new friend, Valerie. Valerie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. My name is Valerie Pichelmeyer. I'm the vice president of Make Mothers uh, Matter and responsible for uh, its advocacy work at the UN. Um, Make Mothers Matter or MMM is an old uh, NGO, international NGO. Um, which basically advocates for women's rights uh, with a focus, uh, particular perspective and focus on, uh, on mothers. I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, I'm also an active member of the NGO CSW Geneva, uh, which is a sister committee of the NGO CSW New York, of course, and I'm also the treasurer of the NGO Committee on Aging in Geneva. So in turn, we would like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, in particular, where you are joining us from. Uh, so mm. I think uh, Kayla is going to uh, put up um, a poll just to, for us to have an idea uh, of uh, where you, you are from. And uh, please also feel free to, to indicate uh, in the chat uh, your name and, uh, and the name of your uh, organization. Uh, so Kayla, maybe if you could put up uh, the poll. So maybe, uh, maybe while you are answering the poll, um, I'm going to um, uh, we would like uh, to draw your attention to the safety guidelines and principles that the NGO CSW New York has put uh, together. Uh, I just put the, the link uh, in the chat. Um, I'm going to, to read um, most of it. Um, we would like you to, to follow the following rules. Uh, use welcoming and uh, inclusive language. Commit to open dialogue and transparency. Remain driven by our collective mission of advancing gender equality, feminism and women's rights. Build a culture of excellence, compassion, integrity and honesty. Respect one another, listen, avoid assumptions, enable different opinions, critique ideas, not people. Allow everyone to participate, don't dominate the conversation and honor time limits. Show empathy towards other participants. Respect the diversity of languages, opinion and expertise while acknowledging that sexism, racism, classism, heterosexism, global North domination and other institutionalized forms of oppression exist. Honor confidentiality and I statements, I instead of they, we or you, speak from your own experience instead of generalize, generalizing. Be positive and security, build people's ideas up rather than knocking them down and refrain from personal attacks. 
the NGO CSW New York will not tolerate harassment of any kind, including but not limited to offensive comments related to gender, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, disability, mental illness, physical appearance, political affiliation, age, race, national or ethnic origin, immigration status, language, religion, or indigeneity, uh, as well as deliberate, deliberate uh, intimidation, sustained disruption of discussion, uh, uh, continued one-on-one -on -one communication after request to, um, to cease. Um, having said that, now we can have a look uh, at the poll. And um, yeah, we can see that a lot of you are coming from uh, North Africa, but uh, I'm really thrilled to see that there are also many people from other region and especially uh, Africa and, uh, and Asia, as well as Western, Western Europe. So thank you very much for answering the, the poll. And uh, Anita, over to you. Uh, the purpose of today's conversation circle is to learn more about issues around economic justice and rights of women, to discuss selected issues in a safe environment, to identify key actions, recommendations that can make a difference, in, and to inspire each other to comments. Uh, we, the, the space is open, we are recording today's session, so please feel to share your comments, you are feel to keep, feel free to, when you are sharing your comments, you can keep your video on, keep it off, depending on how you want to be, I know, uh, put out there because it's going to be recorded. So, uh, but you can also use the chat as well as we are also going to be sharing um, idea boards for each of the sessions, we have three sessions today. So for each of the sessions, we will be sharing idea boards. So we have, you have three ways to respond to the conversations here, raise comments, questions, et cetera, either by you know, using a Zoom control, by raising your hand feature, or by putting posting your comments in the chat or raising it orally. You can also share your comments uh, on the idea boards, which is what we are hoping that all of you will do because it is it is very good to see that you know what your thoughts and processes are, short comments, and then what our plan is that we will summarize the comments and try to come out with a report from this meeting. Um, with that, we will go to our second poll to help us assess what areas in your opinion need urgent attention to advance women's economic justice and rights. You have about five to seven minutes to complete this poll. Uh, Kayla will launch the poll and share the results. Thank you, Kayla.
So we have out of the 90 people in the room, 68 people, as I understand, have voted. Um, so we have 41% saying that access to resources, finance, land, and natural and opportunities for education employment is one of the crucial um, you know, stumbling blocks of economic justice and rights of women. Um, this is closely followed. This is followed by, I would say, the next uh, is uh, unpaid care work is 19%, followed by universal social protection and, um, and intersection discrimination, race and gender follows that, and then universal social protection and austerity measures. So uh, truly appreciate. It's really uh, interesting to see how people uh, think on this and what is actually the crucial you know, areas that we need to focus on. So thank you so much uh, for, the, for your feedback. And I will um, transfer it to Valerie now, so who will begin the first conversation circle on addressing unpaid care work as a root cause of economic justice. Over to you, Valerie. Uh, thank you so much, um, Anita. So, um... Yeah, we had to make some arbitrary choices uh, when we uh, tried to, uh, to, to, when we, as we wanted to, to try to, to focus a little bit the, the discussion. So um, among others, we chose uh, as our first focus, the issue of unpaid care work, um, which is uh, really cross-cutting when we talk about economic justice and rights for, for women. So I'd like to kickstart our discussion uh, on this issue with, with a little video which is produced by the Women's Budget Group in the UK. Um, where, uh, the Women's Budget Group is an advocacy group based, uh, as I said, in the UK, and uh, which is also engaged with their, the government there uh, on gender responsive budgeting. They really do super work. Uh, so I really uh, encourage you to have a, a look at their work. So I'm trying to kickstart this video, but I'm actually not allowed to. The COVID-19 crisis has exposed that the economy is not working. But for women, the economy has never really worked. Women do 60% more unpaid care and domestic work than men. So, women have less time for paid work, are more likely to work part-time, and be in precarious employment. Women are less able to travel for work, which restricts their job choices. Women earn less than men per hour and less overall. This means that they are more likely to be living in poverty and more likely to be poor in older age. They own less and save less than men. Because women earn less and have caring responsibilities, they rely more on benefits and public services like the NHS and are hardest hit by cuts to benefits, tax credits and public services. Black, Asian and minority ethnic women and disabled women are hit hardest of all. Caring is seen as women's work, while earning money is seen as men's contribution to the family, which reinforces gender stereotypes about the interests and roles of women and men in society. So paid care work is seen as something that women do naturally and the skills involved are not recognised. As a result, paid care work is low status and badly paid. Employers make assumptions about women's abilities and likely behaviours. So, women face discrimination in the workplace and their careers progress at a slower rate than men's because they spend more time caring. And this is reflected in the gender pay gap. Women have less time to take part in politics and public life, meaning that women are underrepresented in decision-making positions. As a result, policies and laws are more likely to be based on men's needs. Inequalities based on gender intersect with other forms of inequality based on race, disability, class, age, sexuality, and other identities. 
This means that inequality takes different forms and can be more severe for some women than others. Widespread violence against women and girls is a cause and consequence of women's economic inequality and poverty. Poverty makes it harder to leave an abusive partner while abuse limits women's economic opportunities. So, how do we break this cycle? In order to create an economy that works for everyone, we need to challenge and dismantle structural inequalities. This means recognising and valuing care for what it is, a central part of life. We will all require care at some point in our lives. And ensuring a fairer distribution of unpaid care between women and men. The Commission on a Gender Equal Economy is developing alternative economic policies to promote gender equality in the UK because it doesn't have to be like this. We can do things differently. So I think I don't need to, um, to comment much more, uh, although it obviously only gives a, a developed country perspective. I think we could develop different variations of this spiral of inequalities everywhere in the world. The case is clear and uh, the inequitable distribution of unpaid care work is at the root of many gender inequalities uh, beginning uh, with the economic sphere. And uh, we all know that the pandemic has only exacerbated this situation. So um, you probably all heard about the, the 3R framework that the feminist economist Diane Elson has proposed some years ago to address the issue and that we women rights activists have been using when um, providing recommendations on how to address this issue. Um, these three R's being so far uh, recognition, reduction and redistribution. So recognition is about giving visibility to this work. It's about recognizing that unpaid care work is work, which means that we should consider work in a more holistic way as a combination of paid and unpaid work. It's also about recognizing uh, the essential value of this work, which really sustain our economy. Uh, on reduction, uh, it's about uh, reducing the drudgery and the time that women spend on domestic chores. So it directly links to the development of public infrastructures and services, uh, as well as to a provision of time saving technology. Third, redistribution, uh, first between men and women, but also between families and society. Um, not only the government, but also the private sector. And uh, it's really about uh, framing care as a collective uh, responsibility. In addition to these three R's, uh, different organizations have also proposed two other R's, which are uh, representation. How do we ensure that unpaid caregivers are heard and that their needs and demands are taken into account? And reward. How do we ensure that caregivers do not fall in poverty because of unpaid care work? So um, to conclude this very short uh, introduction, well, I think that all this, uh, this framing uh, and all the, the measures and policies that can be taken under this framework um, are absolutely necessary. There's no question about that, uh, but I think they are not enough. And I'm actually convinced that um, much more systemic changes um, uh, is really needed. Uh, we women have been trying to adapt to a world of work and an economic system which was designed for men, uh, by men, for men, and uh, mostly white men for white men. So I think it's time that the world of work adapts to women and people with caring responsibility. And, um, and also the, our current economic system has been prioritizing um, endless GDP growth and the short term profit over the well being of people and planet. So, um, similarly, I think it's time that we repurpose our economy to a caring economy, uh, which puts the well-being of people and planet really at the center. So I'll stop there. I have already talked too much. Um, now we want to hear from you. So I have prepared um, a few guidance uh, questions uh, uh, for our, our conversation, uh, which are shown uh, here. Um, so I would like you um, to, to, to try to, to reflect on these three questions. How can we uh, raise uh, awareness uh, and educate both the general public and policymakers on the issue of unpaid care work beyond the gender equality circles? Second, what are your views, ideas, recommendations, examples of best practice for each of the five hours? Um, and third, uh, what would a caring economy look like for you? 
how to get there. Um, that is, how could we bring about more systemic changes in our economic system uh, and in private companies? So over to you, um, please really, as, uh, as Anita said at the beginning, um, there are different ways of, of communicating. I will put in the chat now um, the ID board, idea board that we have uh, prepared. And in the meantime, please raise your hand, put comment in the chat. Do not hesitate to, to contribute. I have just put the, sorry, this is the wrong one. These are the, the, the principles. Let me do it again. So please click uh, on the link I just put on the, on the chat and you can provide uh, input by, by using this board. We also really welcome um, any live contribution. Um, but uh, Kayla, I can't see, it would be nice if you could put back everyone so that we can see everyone. Yes, I see already a, a, a hand rising. So, um, Sahar? Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to share two what I felt like were creative solutions that I had proposed to other groups. One, and I've actually seen the model since I first proposed it, Don. So one is this idea of having some form of uh, care being provided by high school students or that equivalent age into households. So it would be an aspect of their education and that they're learning life skills and adult skills, and especially if it's done with young boys. I think this is a nice way to really like uh, counterbalance this over emphasis on, on women doing this work. And it helps to involve the community and teach that skill of um, deconstructing gender roles. Another is one that actually came up in a CSU talk earlier this week, but I thought well, you know, what about these communities? Somebody said, what about these communities where some people have so much and some people have so little? And I'm like, it would be great if we could remove the middleman by having a census in a place where that uh, information is pulled and then resources are given directly from the families that are more affluent to the families that are in poverty in their lo local uh, areas. So I do think that there are so many amazing creative things that we can do on this topic. And I, and I really hope that we focus a lot more on solutions than uh, speculation and theory. Thank you so much. I love uh, in particular your, your, your first idea. I think it's, it's very, very creative. And uh, um, I mean, it, has, it would bring so many advantages, not only for unpaid carers, but also um, for the people themselves to, to learn, for example, about, about parenting or caring more generally speaking. So thank you so much for your, for your contribution. Any other uh, courageous uh, person who would like to, to speak on the, on the issue of unpaid care work? Um, Vicky? Thank you. Uh, I'm Vicky Smallman from the Canadian Labour Congress. Uh, you know, I think that there's been some really excellent work done out there on uh, on unpaid care work, particularly the International Labour Organization's um, report. But I think the, what one key piece that is reinforced in that video that we watched is the need not just to redistribute the burden of care within the households, but also between the households and the state. And the provision of, of quality public care services is essential for uh, reducing and redistributing. And we've seen that bear out in, in places where we have a robust care services, universal child care, for example, or at least affordable quality public child care. You see that it has enhanced women's um, participation in the labor force, but it has also contributed to a more equitable distribution within the household as well, right? Because it essentially helps men to step up. Uh, and so, and, but I do think that, uh, you know, in order to do that, you need a robust, a robust uh, and progressive tax system, um, and you need the political will to sort of not see care services as an expense, but rather as an investment in economic growth and in equity and equality. Thank you so much, Vicky, for your contribution. I couldn't agree more with you on all those points. Um, any other, anybody else would like to, to take the floor and, and bring some other points? Yes, uh, Estelle? 
I, I speak coming from the point of modern slavery and anti-human trafficking, having worked in a couple of countries, both the UK and Italy, um, unpaid care workers, especially within certain um, nationalities. And so the Salvation Army in the UK with the Salvation Army in the Philippines set up a program that has also been implemented to me within the government to make sure that anybody who has possibilities of work in another country is supported to make sure it's the right job. So I don't think as far as we go economically, it's also involved in that there needs to be proper care work and that needs to happen and paid properly. But also this sense of that there are people who are also being trafficked for um, <clears throat> for care work and people who have been trafficked across nationalities, nations, but within nations as well. So there's another whole side to it there. Thank you so much, Estelle. Yes, it's important to bring that, uh, that perspective uh, too. Uh, Rosa? Thank you so much. I, I love your presentation, Valerie. I'm Rosa Lazardi. I'm the Global Director of the Feminist Task Force. And I'm also the co-convener of the Women's Working Group on Financing for Development. Um, and so, you know, I, I really love some of these aspects that you were highlighting about the five R's. Um, and just to, to let folks know um, in this conversation circle that, you know, one of the action areas of the action coalitions, the one specifically on economic justice and rights of which the Women's Working Group is a co-lead, is this area of increasing women's economic empowerment by transforming the care economy. And we're looking specifically at um, some of the tactics to design, finance, and implement measures to recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care and domestic work and reward paid care work. Um, and ensure the representation of women care workers. So those five R's, um, we've really um, uh, implemented them into the work of the action coalitions um, and, and really looking to um, push the needle to um, enact and enforce laws that will help um, in this area of unpaid care work. So thank you so much. Um, I'll put my information in because I know that that right now the Action Coalition's process is uh, also opening up to interested um, members of civil society. And you know, really to to push on this, we're we're going to need all the support and help that that we can get. So thank you so much, Valerie. Thank you very, very much, Rosa, and really thrilled that you participate in the conversation that I, as I've been uh, following the work of your working group for, for a while already. So I would be thrilled to, to get in touch with, with you and uh, so that we can advance this, uh, this topic together. Um, are there any other people? I can see that, um, yeah, Sel, Sel, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name, Sel Far, is it? Uh, Sahar. Sahar, sorry, I, I really right. love No worries. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention, I mean, a lot of times people are, are mentioning social hate and governmental aid supplementing for unpaid uh, care labor. And I think it's really, really important to note the intersection that um, that actually intersectional discrimination plays in that as a means of getting support because you deal with so much institutional violence through those uh, quote unquote government supplemented care uh, uh, additions. And like, I, and I'm speaking also as a single mother with a disabled child who's lived in a lot of different nationalities. I've dealt with like extreme levels of institutional violence by trying to get services. So it's not, I feel like if we're going to have that discussion, we really need to have the discussion about what we are doing in terms of protective measures there. Thank you. Thank you, Sahara. Sah Sah <laughs> um, this is a very, very, very good point and a very important one. I think you are certainly not the, the only one facing this kind of, uh, of issues. Um, so thank you for your contribution. Uh, would somebody else would like to, to take the floor? Yes, Vanessa. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, thank you for having this platform. It's such um, a prevalent um, issue. Um, I think that um, we have to start by recognizing that um, care is not just the job of a woman, right? We have to we have to recognize that everyone, and including men, boys, and young women, you know, have to be responsible for a nurturing 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 a nurturing aspect. Right, because a lot of times we dismiss men from being able to be nurturers, and men can nurture, especially if they, you know, if they, if there's nothing else, if there's no other um, choice, they, you know, they, we have single fathers who raise, who are raising their kids, right? So we have to, we have to put the 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 um, we have to put the word out that nurturing is the responsibility of all family members. And we have to raise our young boys to be nurturers as well, because the care factor when they grow up, a lot of times that nurturing side of them dissipates because they feel like they have to be the man. So there's no time to really care because they have to be the head of the household. They have to be the man of the household. So we have to we we have to teach you know that the responsibility of nurturing is for everybody it's a shared um responsibility so i think you know and and i think that um when once we once we recognize that i think that all the other r's the record the reduction the representation the reward the redistribution will start to fall in line because you because there's parallels you know, it's a each category. So we have to, the recognition has to be the ownership of everyone to be um, a nurturer or a caregiver. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. I think it's a very, very good point uh, as well. It's absolutely crucial to, to engage men. And uh, I would go also as far to say that we should not frame this issue as, a, as, a woman, as only a women's rights issue. It's really um, a, a collective, uh, uh, issue. Thank you so much. Um, is there anybody else who would like to to take the floor? I, I have seen that there are a lot of um, comments in the chat, but um, it's becoming very difficult to fo to follow uh, all all the comments. So I have seen also that uh, very briefly that there are many many input. Uh, on the board, which is really, really nice. Um, I'm not sure how we will be able to, to go through all this um, uh, during the, the, the event, but uh, we will certainly um, look at that uh, afterwards. Valerie, would you like me to read some of the comments? Yeah, that would be really, yeah. Ni really nice. Yes, yes. okay. So let me uh, read a comment from Laurie Johnston. <laughs> Women need institutionalized power to manage domestic, reproductive, ecological care work that has been done without money. Promote decision-making power to use collective resources to plan support and support care work. Um, I'm going through the comments and seeing if I see... Yes, I don't see any other comments. So, I see a lot of introductions, and uh, so great to meet all yeah, of you. The, the, the board is becoming uh, really. Uh, so there is a comment from Pauline. Uh, we have to let the world know that care unpaid care is unpaid work, especially care is not part of our biological makeup, whether we are caring for children, the sick, hold on a minute, uh, um, sick or the elderly, anybody can do it. Oh, that's a great comment. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Can I come in? Yes, please. OK. Uh, I'm Ganet from Action Aid Ethiopia. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. So uh, we're actually, as, an, as Action Aid, uh, we're actually uh, taking this uh, unpaid care work as a policy uh, campaign agenda. And we're trying to, to, to implement the three, the three R's. Uh, but you know it's not easy to you know change uh, the behaviors towards uh, the gendered uh, roles uh, 
so at the grassroots level uh, with our communities, we're trying to engage uh, main voice uh, in this uh, implementation uh, to, 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 to change the, the, you know, the narrative that carries the responsibility of uh, women and girls. And also we are actually doing uh, some uh, interventions which can show the policy makers or the local government actors uh, how to reduce, how to introduce mechanisms or technologies to reduce the, the, the responsibilities of this uh, unpaid care work. Uh, some are like we do, you know, the, 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 the water, uh, accessible water services, availing accessible water services, uh, then women going far and bringing them, uh, you know, they, is heavily, uh, uh, shouldering and which expose them to different health uh, uh, related and also violence while they are traveling a, a long distance to bring uh, to fetch water and to you know fuel uh, uh, wood fuel for for fuels for uh, wood for fuel. So we are doing such kind of interventions. Plus we are also developing uh, child care centers. It's to enable government to show. Uh, how this would mitigate the responsibilities uh, of these uh, women and girls, which is uh, practically happening. So through this, we are also actually re addressing the women's responsibilities uh, or sharing the burden of uh, women, but also, uh, you know, liberating uh, young or um, uh, female who, who would uh, have uh, time to attend school and to you know uh, get the time to play uh, but uh, because of lack of this uh, like early childhood uh, centers this uh, young female uh, or small girls are staying at home looking after their young siblings or smaller siblings while they uh, should have been in school so such kind of interventions are helping uh, our communities and also local governments to take the responsibilities and being accountable for them and for, for the community, uh, we are empowering them to know that this is their right to claim. And uh, we are also uh, you know, engaging men to identify which work uh, that they cannot do among the list of activities the women and girls engage. Uh, you know, they list and uh, we, we check if these are kind of uh, activities that we, the men or the boys cannot do. And we help them to value uh, these services. Like if the women or the girls were not there, how much would they spend on getting these services done? So uh, that they recognize the values of these uh, services. And uh, uh, the challenge I may uh, you know, uh, bring here is in uh, uh, where there is a resource stress or lack of resource, uh, especially during this COVID, we have seen the impact and uh, the, pro the, the forecast, uh, the information is very, you know, uh, alarming that the economy uh, uh, decline impacts the, the care economy. So I don't know how we would push to prioritize this into government's uh, attention and still to uh, invest on uh, or to budget for care. Uh, it's something different and we need a strategy on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gennett, for your, for your contribution. And I would like to, to refer people to, to the excellent work of ActionAid. Um, uh, that ActionAid is actually doing uh, in many countries in Africa. There was an event uh, yesterday or the day before, um, jointly organized with Oxfam, which was really interest, really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, I think the recording is, is available so for interest people. Um, I'd like to give a throw now to uh, Joan, Joan Washington. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Valerie. Hi, my name is Joan and I'm coming from the United States. I want to uh, piggyback on the lady that spoke. It was kind of hard for me to hear her, but I, I just do want to talk about um, the taboo as far as uh, Child care is here in some places in uh, in America, especially in low income families. You can go to school, you can get your degree, you can get a good job at the factory, but get let one of your kids get sick. 
that when your kids get sick, if you don't have a person to take care of that, those kids, if you don't come to work, guess what? You lose your job. So you, so you got a single mom who's trying to make it, paying those bills on time, but she's got to make a, a decision. Can I take a chance on staying home and losing my job? Or do I go to my job and leave my kids at home, leaving my nine-year-old watching four kids a, a stair step? So that's a big problem. Childcare is too expensive for somebody who's just barely making it just enough to eat. You know, so I think what we have to do, particularly, you know, uh, we, we need to have a push for civil society as a whole, get the movers and the shakers involved in talking about this, getting out into in, in a more public venue to say, hey, we need to do something as a community, particularly in communities of color. We need to address this here in America as well, because it is a huge problem, more than people are going to talk about. I just wanted to bring that to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. This is a this is a very important point uh, as well. Uh, childcare is absolutely uh, essential, although it doesn't solve everything. Um, but it's especially essential for for single parents and single moms, uh, especially obviously. Um, and many, I would like to take this point, this opportunity to raise uh, an, uh, an aspect which is all, also very uh, overlooked, which is the intergenerational aspect of uh, unpaid care work. Many people rely actually on grandmothers, <laughs> especially or grandparents, uh, uh, more generally speaking. And uh, this also uh, should be part of the picture. Um, are there any other people who would like to, to take the floor? I have seen in the, in, on the board an interesting comment, comment on uh, universal basic income to, to kind of reward uh, mothers. And um, maybe my question would be, wouldn't, wouldn't it uh, reinforce stereotypes? Would, wouldn't it uh, encourage uh, mothers to, too much mothers to stay uh, at home and, and work? Um, so I just throw, throw that uh, uh, if someone would like to, to pick it up. I see that Anita has uh, gonna... No, uh, An Anru? Aru? Anu. Anu, sorry. Hi. Hi. So um, I agree with what everybody says and universal childcare, we actually, I'm with the League of Women Voters here in Virginia. And we have an issue group recently started. So we're trying to push our state government into at least provide some funding and we've had some success. Uh, but I believe that this problem starts at home too. I mean, I grew up with my grandmother taking care of me. And uh, I think I was more well cared for than my mother could have. She was definitely more patient, fed me better. But she also had, she was with young people. It kept her happy and healthy. And my parents could take care of my grandparents when they needed help. So I think that whole model we used to have of intergenerational mm -hmm. families living together. And somewhere along the way, we have lost sight of that. There is a lot going for, especially I think in Asia, I don't know about Africa, but here in America, of course, there's nothing. But I think maybe there is, if this is time to push for it instead of putting all our seniors in a senior living facility where they're just with other old people. I mean, research shows that older people are happier surrounded by younger people and younger people are happy with older people. Like I've seen here a couple of facilities, there's an, a senior living and there's a, a, a kindergarten and childcare facility on the same campus and they work together. So I think something like that is something so easy to push for. You keep the older people engaged and happy and you keep the younger people well looked after. And most of the time, these older people are happy to do it you know, as volunteers. So it doesn't cost anybody anything and uh, everybody's happy. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Very, very good point. Uh... As well and I can uh, refer to my my own experience uh, in Japan there was a, obviously my own mother was not living there but I could uh, I could call a grandmother from a, a Japanese one from an association uh, 
and that was really nice and, and useful. Um, maybe I will give the floor now to Monica. Monica, edit. Oh, hello. hello. Hi. We can't see you, Monica. Yeah, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm... Okay. Here hello. are you. I am in Guatemala. Ah, oh, welcome. <laughs> Okay, um, I want to comment on what you said at the beginning that the economic system was made by men for men. And that economic system remains till these days and is actually outdated. And the on pay work was created from the beginning, from the roots of that system, without giving that on pay work and economic value. But we know now that that is a factor in the economic system. It has a value. So governments around the world have to recognize that without that work, the system does not work also. Because there's always someone who has to take care of someone else. So to recognize that and to put a value on that is something that has to be made. And now in the pandemic era we are living on, is even more clear, you know? So we have to push that kind of change in the, all the institutions and in a very structural way, see? To recognize that it is a factor, is an economic factor within the system. I completely agree with you, uh, Monica. Thank you for, for this, uh, this comment. Um, Deborah? Um, thank you. Malika, um, her comment is so poignant and I always have something to say, so I try not to sometimes because I have a tendency to dominate the conversation. However, so, uh, I could after not- After three minutes, I will cut you. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to I have to speak up after um, what Malika said, because you just say Malika, right? Um, because what the challenge that we have goes back that long and that far, we would actually be having to redefine what our society looks like because that is so ingrained. And so when I'm on these calls and hearing these conversations and oh, they are needed and necessary, um, my question is, when are we going to stop talking about this? What is the goal? Because what happens is we get a little bit of progress in some areas. And then I guess maybe we get tired because it is very tiring work. I get it, I understand. But then um, there is like a resurgence again, usually something happens. How and when are we going to fix this problem so that it doesn't come back again? That's the question that I really want to address because this talking, having the conversation, you know, highlighting the good work, which we always have to do. But we need to escalate this to a level where it's a change, where these conversations become exceptional and not needed and normal. And we're still there. And the only way that we can get there is going to require some significant change and that change is not gonna come easily. So I always ask the question exactly, what is the goal that we are looking for? How do we know when we get there and what are we willing to do to get there exactly? What exactly are we willing to do? Thank you, uh, Deborah. These are excellent questions. Uh, my, my personal answer would be to, 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 to bring these issues um, outside the, the, the gender equality for us. I mean, we, we have to, to go and, uh, and speak about these issues to all the other sectors, um, because in the end, uh, it's all connected. Um, I'm convinced uh, on that. Um, I see that there are some other hands uh, up. Um, we are running a little bit of time for this first segment, and I'd like to, to give a space now to my colleague, uh, co-facilitator, uh, Anita. Um, so I apologize for, for you uh, who have uh, your, your, your hands up. Uh, maybe there will be some other opportunities in the third part of the, of the event to, 
to continue that discussion. But um, now I'd like to close this first, for first part. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, to all of you for, for your contribution. I think it, it was it's really diverse and, and, and interesting. I also see that there's a lot of post-it on, on the board, which, uh, which I, I'm really thrilled about. So um, we will uh, have a really close look at all that uh, afterwards and, and report. But uh, for the moment, uh, I will just give the floor over to, to Anita for the second part. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. That was excellent and such great conversation as I'm looking at the chat and seeing great ideas, great suggestions, great points where advocacy are coming up. And so I really appreciate all the participation that you have made here. I uh, wanted to just before I uh, open the discussion, I wanted I would like uh, Kayla if she can pull up the video. Uh, it's a very short video um, that NGO CSW actually has put together. And so I would like to share that. Thank you. Are you able to hear the audio at all? Yes, uh, um, I'm not, I don't know. Mm. No. All right. Anita, would you be able to share this video just because my audio input isn't working? Okay, I'm gonna try if I can pull it up from my, hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm going to share this. Anita, when you share your screen, um, you just have to make sure you're selecting share audio as well. Okay, hold on. not able to see that on my end. I'm trying to see what you I'm can on. unshare your screen really fast and then just um, go to reshare it. There should be a little checkbox where you can click share audio as well. Okay. Let me do that. Okay, so you are suggesting that let me just do my And where would that be? The link for that? I'm trying to see audio. I see audio settings. Just click share screen. And then yes, right after uh, you select share screen, there's going to be a little checkbox. Sorry, I'm not seeing a checkbox. Are you seeing it? Uh, let me just play it and see whether if you can hear it. Can you hear it? No. no, you have to huh. um, try stop share. Tell her it's on the same screen where she hits the share screen. It's like right down in the corner. Yeah, un yes, stop, stop, it. stop it. Down stop yeah, I'm not seeing it on my end. And I'm then, sorry. And then go back to share screen. OK. And there should be a little checkbox at the very corner of that white screen that says share sound. Before you have to, you can't click the video yet before you click the screen that you want to share. Okay. <laughs> Um, Anita, maybe I can share the link to Devin, and then in the meantime, I can put the slides up for you if that works. Yes, that would be good. Thank you. Okay, one moment. I'll put the slides up. Okay, I have the video. That, um, oh, that's not the slide. Um, you have to go to the, this is, uh, yes. So you have to go to the next. If you can put play the video, that'll be great. And then. Hello, Jello. How are you? How are you?
The number of women who are both educated and working is at an all-time high, according to a 2018 International Labour Organization report on employment. And studies by the International Monetary Fund show narrowing the gender gap increases a country's GDP. A World Bank report says women migrant workers are responsible for an estimated $601 billion in global remittances. Now, even though 48.5% of the world's women are working, that figure is still 26.5% lower than the number of men who work. Globally, women earn 77 cents for every dollar a man makes. And out of 189 countries assessed in 2008, 104 of them have laws preventing women from working in specific jobs. 59 countries have no laws on sexual harassment at work and husbands can legally prevent their wives from working in 18 countries. According to the UNDP, one of the barriers to women's economic empowerment is unpaid work. Research shows women's unpaid work could amount to an estimated $10 trillion in GDP a year this is why more needs to be done to improve the socio-economic statuses of women. Eliminate discriminatory practices by employers such as the denial of employment and dismissal due to pregnancy or requiring proof of contraceptive use. Enforce laws and regulations that ensure international labor standards such as the International Labor Law Organization Convention No. 100 on Equal Pay for Female and Male Workers. Provide social security benefits for part-time, temporary, seasonal and home-based workers. Promote career development based on work conditions that harmonize work and family responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Devan, for sharing that. Um, and also the three questions that, uh, that for this session, um, it should be following the questions that, these are not the questions. So there are, um, these are the questions from the previous session. Yes, so you don't need to share them now. Let me, uh, I can do the press, or you can keep it there while I do the presentation. That's totally fine. Thank you so much. Um, so um, just uh, following up on what Valerie had shared, we, Valerie and I had major discussions on what are some of the points that we should bring in. And uh, she brought in the uh, you know, point of unpaid care work, but I felt, you know, we felt it was important to really talk about uh, decent work, equal access to resources and opportunities and universal social protection for advancing economic justice and rights, especially in the current climate, what we are seeing with regard to the impact that's having on women, the, the rising domestic violence, the loss of jobs for women. And, and so it is very important for us to stay focused and really ensure that women come out of these circumstances, especially when the governments are putting in place as new measures and that focus be given 100% a major portion, it should be given to women to ensure that, you know, women as caregivers, you know, who take care of their children, their mothers, their families, you know, that they are have the resources at their disposal to advance their businesses, to get their skill sets up, to go back to school, whatever it may be required for them to advance their career goals and move on to a different path so that the gender gap is addressed. So um, I'm a numbers person and I wanted to share, I know a few specifics that are out there. So the COVID-19 Global Gender Response track, Tracker by UNDP and UN Women show that the social protection care crisis and job responses have largely ignored women's needs with only 177 measures 10% of the total across 85 countries explicitly aimed at strengthening women's economic security. And less than one third of countries, 60 in total, taking action to support unpaid care and strengthen care services for children, older persons, or persons with disabilities. Of the nearly 5 million working age population of the world, of world women make 50%. However, only 50% of that population participate in the labor force compared with 80% of men. 
In addition, employed women predominantly work in the informal sector, especially in developing economies, where employers are subject to fewer regulations uh, and women, fa women are faced with low wages, lack of social protection and job losses. Even when women working in the formal sector and have similar level of education as women, men, they are faced with issues of gender pay gap and lower pension as they spend lesser time in the labor force due to unpaid care work. A recent study by the World Economic Forum shares that the COVID-19 pandemic creates an additional setback to closing the gender gap and that at that, at the current rate, at this rate, it will take 257 years until men and women get paid the same rate for the same work. We know the work that is cut out for us, what we need to do as women to advance the right economic justice, the rights of women. Uh, women also face more challenges in starting and running their own businesses compared to their male counterparts. Closing the entrepreneurial gender gap is estimated to increase the global GDP by 2.5 trillion US dollars to 5 trillion. Additionally, it is estimated closing the racial earning gap resulting from disparities in health, education, incarceration, and employment opportunities would boost trend growth by 0.5% per year through 2050. The uneven playing field between men and women uneven playing field between men and women imposes a large cost to the global economy. More action is needed to ensure women have access to resources necessary for train and, and necessary training and capacity building to start their own enterprises. Rosa mentioned in her comment earlier, the importance of transforming economic empowerment of women and girls. The organization I represent Women First went through a major rebranding two years back for this very same reason. We were providing grants to organizations for one year, our grassroots women grantees for one year, and learned that once the grant cycle was complete, the grassroots organization that we funded found it difficult to be sustainable. So we made a strategic decision to work in partnership with each of our grantees in the six countries that we fund now for a period of six years. So we stay with them for six years to ensure that their long-term sustainability and really you know, build their capacity to reach that point where they are able to be sustainable in the long run to advance the work that they're doing within their own communities. So more organizations need to step up as they partner with grassroots women organizations to ensure that their capacity is built, they stay sustainable, and so they're able to take it in their own hands to really make progress at the country level that is required to ensure you know, that we address these gender gaps that are prevalent. Women, women's economic rights are fundamental to their human rights. There is no other time like now for us to act, to collaborate and generate momentum and advocacy to ensure women do not continue to face economic injustice due to the burden of unpaid care work, gender wage gap, lack of access to finance to start a business, inequities in access to resources and opportunities, the threat of violence or harassment in the workplace, and in, in turn, importance of really advocating to, advocating to advance ILOC 190, and other detrimental social and cultural and lack of opportunities to lead, to be mentored and mentored and to participate in decision-making roles, to name a few of the areas that we need to address to ensure we address the gender gap. I invite all of you to share your thoughts, challenges faced, best practices. It could be your organizational decisions that you have made to advance women's economic empowerment, to address the gender gap, the gender pay gap, um, and recommendations to advance advocacy for women's economic justice and rights. So I open the floor with that. Um, and uh, I'm also going to post in the chat um, idea board so that you can actually you know, share your comments. Uh, right on to that. Now, this is a very long link. I wish I was... No, uh, I, I, I just posted the link, uh, Anita. Oh, Don't perfect. Worry. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. We work so well together. <laughs> so I open the floor for comments um, and reactions and uh, feel free to share this in open space. So, you know, do not feel intimidated. Please say whatever it is that you would like to share that, you know, we need to bring to the forefront. So thank you very much. So you can either raise your hands, post your comments to the, um, the board, or you can um, post comments in the chat and we will call out questions from the chat as well. So I'm looking for someone to raise their hand.
I have my hand raised. I am not seeing you. Can you? Okay, go ahead, Joan. It's Joanna. Michelle, no, it's How Michelle. do I say your name, Joanne? That was somebody else. I'm yeah, sorry. Okay. It was Nichelle. Yeah, yeah, that was Nichelle. Okay, Nichelle. Okay, hello, Nichelle. How are you? Thank I'm you. I'm doing Please well. Go Good ahead. morning, everyone. Morning. I know we have people from all across the world. So it's morning here in New Jersey. I'm about a half hour outside of New York. Just wanted to thank you, Anita, for that wealth of information. And I know you had to go through it so quickly, uh, but there was such powerful information in there. And um, I'm I'm a founding board member of Elect Women New Jersey. Um, there, there's so so many great ideas and and notes that I'm feverishly taking um, to to create solutions, to create the conversations that lead to solutions. Uh, the way I see it is, is all these women, all of you beautiful women are so dynamic and, and powerful. Um, we, we have to run for office, right? We have to, we're the ones who have the solutions and we need representation. Otherwise, we're just asking and begging and, and restating our case year after year of why uh, we need implementation of new policies that support uh, economic advancement, educational advancement, access to health care for women and, and our children. Um, so ladies, you know, get ready and, and get yourself in position. Go to your your um, your township chairs, your county chairs and find out uh, the best ways to prepare yourself to run for office because we need all of you. And if if every woman on this call ran for office, you know, we, we would um, make the world a better place. So I just, I'm saying thank you to everyone, but um, let's let's be the warriors in public that we are right here and get yourself ready. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. That's incredible. That's excellent point that you made. You know, women are warriors and women need to be on the forefront to be, you know, really, you know, run the war, face the war. And so, and appreciate the call for women running for office because it is key that women are in decision-making roles at all levels, whether it's on corporate boards, whether it's a legislative council, it is important that women are there and you know, only women can advance the voices of they have other women. And so it is very important to do that. We understand what the, the struggles women go through. So it is important for women to be at the table. So thank you for raising that. Power to you. I, <laughs> I, I call on Joanne. Joanne, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And I do want to make a comment uh, on what was just said. Actually, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, I was going to also interject that one of the things that back in the day, you know, I am a grandmother, I have five grandkids. Um, what we did in order to get the word out, yes, we need to let the our senators know what we're doing. We need to let the, um, the county seats know what we're doing. We need to go back to the churches from where I'm coming from and let them know what's available because people won't say anything. You never know what those folks who don't have access to computers, who don't have access to transportation, we don't know what their needs are, but guess what? We see, we see them in the churches. You know, We will see them because then they bring their kids, they bring the grandkids. So you're able to talk with them on their level so that they don't feel isolated and they don't feel um, that they aren't able to get their points across. So then we will be able to carry that message for them and to those leaders that can make that change. And also I, I am a part of the American Human Rights Coalition and it's a very powerful group. And it, this is the NGO that brought me to you. We put on dynamic community forums on Zoom because of COVID-19. We have the judges, we have the FBI, we have the CIA, we have the mental health, we have the chief of police in different parts of Metro Detroit, and we have the intergenerational young folks that can really take what we say and put into action. So we need to go to that next step. And I have to agree with this young lady that was just talking. We get the information and then we move it to that next step. How do we get it out into the com community? We go to social media. We let those young people push it in the way that it can be the get the widest media attention. And these are some of the ways that we can, it's gonna take a long time, but guess what? We gotta start somewhere. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joanne, for raising those very, very important points and also highlighting the issue, the importance of having young people in these discussions. As you see, one of the questions that we raised was specific to young people, the challenges they are facing in the current climate, and really using this momentum and the conversation that we are use, having to use avenues like yours to connect with the right people so that we bring it to the higher level. Like, you know, conversation is important, but it is networking to go to the next level to advance what we have to put out there and really connect with people in power to do that. So thank you for what you shared. Um, and you know, and we have we are taking notes, so we will come back to you after this to see how is it that we can advance this discussion. As you know, we are talking about ILOC 190, ratification of ILOC 190 is crucial for the advancement of women in the workplace to address the violence against women in the workplace. And so we need as many supporters as we can get in the United States across the world. So grassroots level advocacy is definitely needed. So thank you for sharing that. I call on Sandy. Um, on Yalo, if I'm not going in order, I'm just going by the order I'm seeing on my screen. So I uh, open up to Sandy now, and then I'll come back to the others. Thank you, Sandy. The floor is yours. We can't hear you, Sandy. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. I'm from um, Ujengo Global Community. Um, we're an international organization that um, serves um, and, and supports um, peoples of African descent, both in the global north and the global south. I think one of the things that I want to say, which is very similar to what the two sisters said before me, is that much of the time as women, we're talking to ourselves about the issue and much of the time we know the stats, we know the issues. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the problems is both nationally and globally, um, those people in power, usually you know, white men, aren't, are not interested in some of the things that we have to say. For example, at the, um, I'm working with a group to write a, a briefing for the upcoming G20 and we are, um, we're the only group that is speaking from a gender analysis because the politicians, the decision makers are not interested in um, a, gender, a gender thread in all of the other items. So I, I, like the other sisters, really believe that we need to have, because politicians um, think in terms of four and five year phases, right? When they get elected. So that's why the wind shifts depending on whether, um, you know, what, what government is in power. And I think um, as the sisters before said that we need to expand this to talk to people who are in power, men who are in power, rather than just talking to ourselves. And we need to have a strategy that, it, that is an intergenerational strategy so that when we kind of get tired and we want to retire from this work because it's exhausting, we've already, we're building the foundation of the next generation who is going to be focused on talking to those people in power about our issues. It's great that we have these conversations and we have them all the time, but at some point we have to stop talking to ourselves and talk to the people who can make concerted change. And I also agree that more women need to be in decision-making positions because more women are going to be able to change the landscape um, and what it looks like for women um, globally, nationally and globally. And, I, and then the final thing I wanna say is with all of these issues, indigenous communities and racialized communities are always disproportionately affected by everything that we're talking about. Social protection, social inclusion, unpaid work. Indigenous and racialized communities always are in, um, disproportionately affected by women's issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That was, uh, again, very insightful. And uh, the, what, the point you made about building the foundation for the future is just so key and to stop talking. So 
I, I mean, I would say that, you know, we submit, you know, endorse letters to the UN, you know, to member states, but, you know, what action are we generating is that once we submit it, then what happens to that? The follow up is key. It is important to ensure that we as you know women activists we really put the pressure once we submit something really generate that 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 the connection within the network to say that you know what advocacy is needed where to put pressure on who and you know i'm hoping that we will do that you know we have to work i also think it is very important to work outside silos i work on financing for development this is the ngo committee on status of women but it's finance is such a crucial factor to all the work that we do and so it is very important to understand what how finance impacts all this and to bring the you, a point that you brought about about bringing gender discussions into every single aspect of the conversations that are going on really looking at it from a microscopic view to understand why is gender not included here and i know there are women in this room there are women like rosa emilia and many of the women from ngo csw that i'm familiar with are who are doing it constantly and i really appreciate that this gender focus is brought in i see winifred in the room and so i see a lot of women who are you know really focused and doing this great work and that's what we need to do not stop talk stop talking we need to continue talking but i also start acting on it right and so it's very important appreciate that uh, and then i go to joey joey lim thank you joey Hi, um, good evening, everyone. I'm like currently in Australia. So it's like, you know, 1020 p.m. right now. Um, but yeah, I think with what everyone is saying, I'm just really inspired with what everyone's talking about, like intergenerational, um, like involving everyone into the discussion. Because um, I recently co-founded Young Women Against Sexual Violence. And, um, you know, I'm only 20. I only started this last year. Um, and it's, yeah, <laughs> and for me, um, the reason why I started this is because I have experienced sexual violence and I was a victim of sexual violence. And um, yeah, I realized how important these policies and regulations are, and especially as a young woman, um, I, I'm only 20, this, this happened, like I had trigger warning, I had experienced a rape when I was um, 18. And so I didn't know about these regulations and laws that I could you know, put in place. I didn't know that you could report about this. And, you know, um, especially as a young woman and talking about these discussions with other young women and my friends, we start to normalize our experience. We start to normalize these attitudes, behaviors, like, oh yeah, it wasn't rape. It was just like, it's what the social like media says. Like, it, it's not as bad as what the movies portray it to be. Or it's not like a stranger in the alleyway. He's just a guy friend. And so we start normalizing these and we start like, um, you know, we don't talk about these issues. And again, like it, it starts becoming into like, um, we only start talking among it with our friends. Um, but yeah, I think that's why it's just so important to like have young people involved in this issue um, and also to involve um, our voices when it comes to laws. And instead of relying on the old boy network that's happening in the parliament and how we shouldn't have more women, more people in, um, uh, ethnic backgrounds, especially in the Asian background, um, we don't talk about these issues. It's very taboo to talk about this. And when I started talking about it, it was a very bold move of me to do it. And but once I started talking about this, a lot of more other people um, shared their stories and realized that this is an issue that has been like kept under the carpet, it's become a shadow epidemic. So yeah, it's really inspired by what everyone's been saying. Um, and that this this is a very prevalent issue. And yeah, I'm just so glad that there's a network here for everyone to just work together um, and make this um, a holistic approach. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you for being in the room and thank you for mm -hmm. signing up, even though it's so late for you and for sharing your concerns with us. And you raise a very important point, how important it is to educate young women about their rights and especially you know, you're living in uh, you're living in a developed world, but there are women in the developing world who have no access to any of this information. Not in schools. It's not taught in schools. Uh, you know, they don't learn about it even after they are violated again. So it is important that we as women advocate to have these you know resources be provided to girls at a very young age, so they you know they are strengthened and have the capacity to really stand up for their rights. Um, we are at 1022. I don't know how we want to run it, and I wanted to ask Kayla whether we are able to have i'm not sure uh, but i can um just ask for one uh one, one more question and then i can go to valerie to wrap up but in the meantime
meantime, please post your comments um, in the chat and also on the idea board so that we have uh, a lot of feedback from all of you. Uh, Dekeldi, um, if you want to just uh, share your comments. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, make sure you're clicking. <laughs> um, so I am calling in from uh, Tanzania. I'm a South African. Um, so, you know, I was just actually thinking that, um, you know, thinking about the South African case, whereby we have actually brilliant laws in terms of, you know, gender equality um, and all these other opportunities that are there. Um, and, and I think just recently we've had, um, you know, sort of the higher education department working on sexual harassment policy, uh, because which did not exist before. And has, this has been obviously the result of uh, young women's activism in South Africa, right? Um, and then I'm also then thinking about um, the fact that we, I mean, in South Africa, again, um, there is a relatively sufficient political representation of women, right, in, in, in public office, yet we still find ourselves in situations whereby there is still relatively a lot of um, uh, gender-based violence, there's still a lot of marginalization of women uh, in the economic sphere and so forth. So I just wanted to sort of come in, uh, in that point of, um, in as much as we may have, um, you know, the sort of proper representation of women in the public sphere or in politics for that matter and decision-making in that sense, we also need to fact test the system, sort of, sort of patriarchal systems, right? The nature in which they, for some reason, even if women enter the, those spaces, um, it may not necessarily always mean change or ease, um, sort of easy transformation. And in most cases, women who are in leadership positions are actually experiencing a lot of challenges, right? Many challenges, which actually then make their own leadership um, uh, uh, sort of journeys um, um, exhausting and challenging as well, right? So, so these are some of the other issues that hopefully then we can also factor. I mean, um, and now we've had also conversations in South Africa recently in the past two years, um, sort of conversations about women in the corporate sphere as well, right? Some of all of the challenges that are happening in that space, um, that yes, in as much as we have a lot of women um, going into the, into the boardrooms, um, again, there's still sort of um, sort of patriarchal violence that takes place there. And again, this is linked to sort of the systematic nature of patriarchy. And I think that's one of the things that we may have to um, sort of think of, and I mean, how do we do that? How do we then sort of empower women? How do we then support women? How do we create networks and, and, and sort of, um, I don't know, coalitions that would or and, and whatever else that will also help facilitate the transformation of sort of systematic transformations. Um, and then the other thing also that I wanted to highlight is that it's, it's also important to understand the nature of the various states in which um, um, I guess we operate within in as much as in certain instances that we may say that politicians are, you know, it may have relative power to do this and that. Um, we definitely know, or at least, I mean, I'm a political economy lecturer in South Africa. Um, at the Nelson Mandela University, um, and I'm also a uh, co-founder co of uh, an NGO called Afro Sawa, Women for Public Leadership. So one of the things that I, is happening in essay is that the economy itself, it's structured in a way that really makes it difficult for mobility for, uh, you know, sort of women, but not just women, but Black people as well, right? So there's, there's also that sort of structural racism or so systematic racism um, that, that, that still prevails in the country. And, and, and that also would then have implications on who actually can make decisions. And then also, I mean, there's this term that even our students have created of late that we actually have um, what is, what is public, public managers, right? Sort of political managers are not necessarily the ruling class. And that is actually the effect in South Africa. So you may have politicians, but these politicians don't necessarily have the level of power to make serious fundamental changes. And in cases whereby there are fundamental sort of decisions that are made at policy level, then there's the issue of implementation, right? Then there's the issue of implementation. So I just wanted us to also sort of factor that, as we factor that, also think about how then do we create um, avenues or whatever it is that we can create to think about um, to support women who are in sort of in those spaces, right? Because it's not enough to just usher women into the spaces, but it is also important to support women who are in those spaces because they're never really fun um, and gracious to women. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that very important uh, point, uh, Dakeldi. It's, it's also, you know, you raise some key issues with regard to patriarchy, the way it is, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's in the in politics, it's the same situation ever, everywhere. And it's, it's also important for the support that women need to advance in these spaces. So, you know, as women, but that doesn't mean it is, you know, the current climate is such that more accountability is called off called on all ends, whether it's in the space of politics, whether it's in the corporate boardroom, and we need to put pressure and really take advantage of the current situation where new rules are being put into place and how is it that we can ensure that women in those rooms are have the necessary support and that women, more women step to that role. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I, I don't think I have any more time to ask questions. We are really, really tight on time. I have Christine, I have Rhoda, I have Farsi, Farsi Jana here, and you know, I'm not sure, I'm, I don't think. Kayla, do we have time for another 10 minutes? So we don't. No, we kind of have a hard stop at 10.30. Okay, all right, okay. So with that, I would like to close and I request that you share as many comments as possible on the um, idea boards. Um, and um, so this has been a great conversation. So thank you so much. I pass it over to Valerie so that uh, she can also uh, do her wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anita. And, um, and indeed, uh, thank you so much to, to all of you who provided uh, really, really interesting uh, input to, to that conversation. Uh, there were so many points discussed, but I can't really uh, uh, summarize everything. Um, maybe um, I'll, I'll conclude by bringing up issues that go nearly beyond the, 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 the area of economic justice and, and rights. Um, I have noted down, for example, the, the importance of educating young women for, for about their rights, um, the importance of public leadership and uh, uh, the importance of running for, for, for election in order to, to, to grab that power over there, that decision-making uh, power. Um, I, have, I have noted down the importance of implementation. It's true that um, uh, our governments have committed to so many things uh, that they do not deliver. How do we make them accountable? This is this. We should have a, a whole conversation on, on this issue. Um, what else? Um, I, I also have noted down the, the importance of working across sectors. Um, I think we have to stop uh, talking uh, among ourselves and get out there, get out, get get, get to these um, other forums. And uh, the, the G20 was mentioned, and I think yeah. this is a great example of forums we, we should get in. Um, uh, earlier, I just uh, put a question out there: Is there any man in the in, any man in the room? And nobody answered. So I suspect we we are only women here. Um, and I think this is part of the problem as well. So um, let's let's talk with men, especially uh, many are actually convinced feminists when we we talk to when we engage with uh, with them. So let's take them on board and uh, and uh, really educate um, the general public uh, around all these uh, these issues. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your participation. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I, I would love to continue the, the conversation um, and uh, I hope we can we can somehow do it. Uh, we will certainly do a report uh, on, on this event with all the great input we, we have received. I don't know, Anita, if you would like to add something? No, Valerie, you have you know, summed it up perfectly. And so I think, you know, when women come together, there needs to be some action that is generated out of it, especially in such a space. And so we need to generate action. So our, we will compile the notes and we hope all those who participated, we will share the notes with you, keep it live so that you can provide additional feedback. So, and then we can see how we can build momentum. Thank you all. Thank you again to all and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.